financial year, your council tax bill for the next 12 months arrives in the post. On your bill, below the figure you're charged for council services, is the amount you contribute towards paying for the police. It's called the police precept. This currently accounts for around 30% of police budgets. Police and crime commissioners can only top up the funding from central government in order to invest in more policing by raising the precept. Police funding, both from the government and the council tax, has fallen by almost a fifth during the last decade. In Gloucestershire, this means a cut of around £30 million since 2010 and nearly 300 fewer officers to police our streets. Inevitably, those cuts mean more is expected of those who remain, and that's at a time when crime becomes more sophisticated and new types of crime emerge. Last year, Gloucestershire's Police and Crime Panel supported Martin Searle's request to raise the precept by the maximum recommended by the Home Office. The extra £1 per month for Band D homeowners meant an additional £1.7 million for the constabulary. This year, government is allowing PCCs to raise the precept by an additional £2 per month. Rod, well, we're aware that we now have the opportunity to ask the public to pay a little bit more for their policing. Um, last year, you had an increase of £1 per family per month, which I brought some investment. Could you just tell us the difference that's made and what you did with it? Yes, and uh, we were grateful to receive it. It was put into helping us to relaunch neighbourhood policing. We'd never not had a neighbourhood op offer, um, but in recent years leading up to last year, uh, it was getting thinner and thinner on the ground and needed reinvigorating. So we used a bulk of that money to help uh, reinvest in neighbourhood policing, which to me is the bedrock of our policing model. We invested in additional uh, detectives to help in particular with uh, tackling child sexual exploitation and abuse. There were some vulnerabilities in the, in the service that we were providing in that important area, and it was right to shore that up with some of the uh, money that uh, was provided through last year's precept increase. We invested in uh, some uh, support and capability to uh, ensure good, swift, effective justice. Behind the scenes, there is important and difficult work that needs to take place to make sure that offenders are brought to justice. And that was under tremendous pressure with changes to the criminal justice process and the system and the uh, um, advancements in cloud technology and some developments that we had to keep up with. And finally, we used an amount of the money to invest in body worn video, which is being rolled out to operational <coughs> officers uh, from March onwards. Some already have it, but the main rollout will be uh, well underway by March of this year. Now, my understanding is only a small percentage have that at the moment. So is that the situation? I, I, I know things take time. Where are we on body worn video for the, yes, for the so staff? There was, there was a proper amount of due diligence on the technology that we wanted to purchase. There are options. Which camera do we buy? How do we store the footage, which is more challenging often than the actual equipment itself? The cameras are quite standard now. They're high quality. What do we do with the footage when we record it? Do we keep it switched on all the time? Do we switch it on for just specific incidents? And does it get stored on a recorder or does it get stored up on the cloud? And can we access it when we want it? Taking the, amount, the right amount of time to be clear on what we need precisely to do the job going forward as what is what's taken the time. Uh, there has been some, um, so that some devices have been issued and they're, they're being well used and they're proving very, very valuable. The primary rollout for operational staff, as you suggested, Martin, um, commences in earnest in March this year. So really okay. by midway through the calendar year, they'll be out on the streets and being used and that will have a material impact on reducing demand, uh, assisting in the reduction of uh, complaints and also helping to give our staff the much needed sense of security that they have doing a difficult job yeah. because they do get injured. what the public were really telling me what they wanted to see was neighbourhood policing back. What kind of progress have we made on that? Everything starts and ends in a neighbourhood, whether it's theft of milk, public disorder or terrorist um, incidents. So being grounded in the neighbourhood, whether that's as a detective, a response officer or a beat manager, PCSO, special constable, volunteer, police staff member, we're all embedded in the neighbourhood. However, the definition of what we then go on to do with our time in the neighbourhood is probably what's been changing in recent years. 
we have to make sure that we're visible, attending the right meetings, to be present and listen to local problems. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we're tackling the 14 year old that's being groomed online in her bedroom and trying to decide where we put that resource to greatest effect is what people are probably noticing. So if we try to tackle cybercrime, uh, sextortion, online grooming, and some of the other more hidden threats, they're important, but it might take us away from the traditional visible roles that people can remember from the past. What I want is neighborhood policing with bite. That means neighborhood teams should be alive to the threat in their local area, whether that's from an organized crime group member, from um, a care home that needs support and visibility through to schools, visits, uh, and tackling antisocial behavior and a whole raft of other things. We're there to do a job to keep people safe from harm. So we're progressing well, um, and <coughs> with further investment, we can do more. In the consultation that I've been doing recently, there's been quite a lot of people saying, I want to see the Bobby on the beat. I haven't seen a Bobby walk down this street for oh, forever, uh, and I don't want to pay. What Can we just deal with this Bobby on the beat? What, what, you've got lots of officers, or not as many as you want. What is the Bobby on the beat in 2019 as we are now? Well, that officer will probably be busy on their way to a call for service. Uh, we know that we've had an increase in 999 calls nationally, and that's um, the same here in the county. We know that there's been an increase in mental health characteristics in some of the calls for service that we have. That requires more time to deal with extra vulnerability. Um, and the radio is still going. Calls for service still keep coming in. Uh, we know that we're expecting a lot from our officers when they get to an incident, even if it's a more traditional crime type, let's say a burglary. Um, a theft, a neighbour dispute. Uh, they still have to look in the cupboard for food in case there's child neglect. They still have to look under the bed in case there's cash for money laundering. They need to make sure that the dog isn't dangerous under the Dangerous Dogs Act and doesn't maul a neighbour in three months' time. And then they've got to do the job they're there for in a compassionate, supportive and efficient way with the radio still going. They're generally single crewed and the demand is great. When they're not doing that, they will be present in our communities. They'll either be with a victim, a witness, dealing with an offender, or going from one job to another. There will be capacity for them uh, on increasingly rare occasions to go on patrol and to be present. Um, that's the primary purpose of a neighborhood offer, to make sure that we do protect to some extent a beat manager, a school's liaison officer, a beat officer, a school's beat officer as we call them now, uh, PCSOs, special constables to be present, but they're there with purpose, so they will be working hard whilst they're doing it. People are not particularly impressed with the 101 service, and sometimes they <coughs> express to me, well frequently, that contacting the police, getting that contact into those busy offices can be quite difficult. And you're asking for about a half million pound extra to improve that and other services. Can you just tell us what difference that would make if we invest in making the police more accessible? Yes, there's a couple of um, points I'd like to make. The first is that the nature of the way in which the public prefer to contact us is changing. Of course, it's evolving and adapting. Uh, some people want to contact us by text, some by email. Some uh, want to compare us to uh, what it's like to use their online banking service and they want it to be almost without a person. Um, and that needs to be slick and accessible for them 24 seven. Some people like to still come into our front offices. Some people like to phone us. Some people like to talk to us on the street. So our channels of communication are broad and it's very difficult for us to close any one of those channels down. We have to keep them open, but shift resource into the ones that are changing the most and, and placing the most pressure so that we can give the best service. Now, making sure that we've got money to invest in those channels of communication is what we're working on. That's point one. The second point is that uh, over time, uh, we want to make sure that the experience for people when they speak with us is compassionate, it's, um, it's timely, uh, and it's appropriate with a view to service recovering the, the reason they've called us. And in the past, I think we focused on responding, getting to the incident and trying to repair it afterwards. What we want to do is have 
proper encounter with a member of the public who's requesting a service from us so that we can resolve it at the earliest point in time. That requires a more customer care approach, a more compassionate approach, and uh, uh, I'm afraid to say on occasion additional resource. In the meantime, the whole request for 4.1 million with 74 extra staff, should you approve it, will take demand uh, out of the system. So whether it's for response, whether it's for nighttime economy, I would expect every one of those 74 individuals to be adding value that takes out the need for people to call us in the first place. Somehow we've got, a, we've got to get ahead of the number of calls that are increasing dramatically across the country. Otherwise, we're always in reactive mode and not in uh, prevention mode. So the whole offer will help, but focusing specifically on the quality of the service that people get and the timeliness of our ability to answer the calls is what we're going to invest in. Which moves me on to the main area of investment in the letter you sent to me, which is around safer days and nights, I call it. I mean, everybody in the county, whoever they are, has the right to feel safe, both day and night, whatever they're doing in the county, as long as it's, 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 it's uh, lawful. And you've indicated you'd like to spend nearly two and a half million pounds extra in that area, which I absolutely welcome. And um, I want to support this. What will the difference be for the public? Because it's a big investment, okay, against £30 million pound loss. It doesn't sound so big, but what will they get for that money? What will they see? There's two primary aspects to this. The first is reassurance. The more present we are, I'd like to think the more reassured the public are, that they can go to the cinema, the theatre, to the restaurant, just go for a walk. Mm -hmm. They can mix with people who are in the bars and the clubs, with people who are in the cafes or the cinema and feel that they can pick and choose with some safety um, what they want to do in our nighttime economy. It's a fantastic county to enjoy a nighttime economy. Why wouldn't we allow them to do that with a sense of security? So presence is important. The second aspect is that, um, if I give you an example, Martin, uh, I spoke to a colleague um, some months ago now. Um, she was single crewed initially on foot in the nighttime economy. There was a, a nasty assault um, by an individual who was drunk, possibly under the influence of drugs, who'd assaulted an individual who was now in need of medical attention. The offender is walking away, is bigger than her, and was aggressive. The victim was lying uh, uh, in a doorway that needed attention. There was evidence that needed securing and witnesses that needed um, speaking to. A single crude officer has a decision to make. Now, of course, they'll go straight to the victim to make sure that they're you know, if they're bleeding, they, they triage the bleeding and they give medical care. But once that's secured, what does that officer do? Do they secure the evidence, secure the witnesses, or go after the offender? And she did all of that um, in the right order, went after the offender and was assaulted, punched in the face. It actually turns out she was assaulted twice that night on a night, turn, uh, on a night shift. Mm -hmm. Now the point for me is we can survive without additional resource in that nighttime economy and we'll do the very best we can. Our staff, our men and women, do amazing work every day and every night. But with more, we can do more. Uh, and what I would like is for that individual to feel the full weight uh, of a police team that arrests them swiftly, brings them into custody, and holds them to account for their behaviours and allow the court then to do its, um, its role in society and in seeing that through. It's not acceptable for that sort of behaviour to take hold in our county, and I want it addressed. Will they see a real difference? Because I get the impression this is quite important to you. It is. And um, you know, we're hoping to invest with the money uh, in what we call a support group. It's um, we, we have what, what is a support group? For I, I know it's a, I'm a former officer, you know that. Well, I think I know, maybe I don't. It's a police term for uh, a sergeant and six officers who are very well trained to work together. Uh, they're often used, they're used for many things. Um, house-to-house -house inquiries um, uh, during a homicide investigation. They work very well as a team. You can put a lot of resource into a concentrated activity and they do it extremely well. Uh, but they're also extremely good at um, disarming violent offenders, um, addressing violence in the nighttime economy. Much harder to punch one officer in the nose when there's five or six others stood alongside, isn't it? Um, and it's not about making this a confrontation, it's about making sure that we can stamp out inappropriate behaviour that does the very opposite of what I've started off saying people want in the nighttime economy, or I think they want, which is to go about their business in peace without fear of being assaulted.
and I don't expect <coughs> police officers to be assaulted without consequence. Okay. So whilst you said you can cope without it, I know your supporters are very busy dealing with county drug lines, organised crime, etc, etc, etc. To actually put those resources on the street in the nighttime economy and elsewhere where people are misbehaving, being violent, putting our young people at risk, putting our trade at risk, you can put those back on the streets. We have three support groups in this county at the moment. They're almost exclusively used for tackling the dangerous drugs network, county lines, organised criminality, exploiting young people, using extreme violence to peddle drugs and, and traffic people. Um, that's important and noble work. If they're doing that, they're not in the nighttime economy. So what I mean by saying we can cope without them is that I think there's a gap and it doesn't sit comfortably with me. My responsibility is to keep people safe from harm in the county. Uh, with more resource and more money, I can do more. And I think the communities of this county deserve it. One of my priorities right from the beginning was to understand our roads, the safe and social driving. I think we have the right to use our roads. We know that they are there. We pay for them. It should be a pleasant experience or not a bad experience. That's, that's for sure. And some good work's been done on that by your staff and also by the fire service and the county council and others. A huge amount of work to make our roads safer. But you've known for a long time, I've been saying this to you uh, privately and sometimes publicly, I think the specialist roads policing has fallen apart to such a level that it's not really what fit for purpose anymore. I also understand with the cuts that you faced when you talk about dangerous drug networks, you have to prioritise. This is an opportunity, I think, to try to redress that balance. Um, so what would the difference would the public see around, can we just say specialist roads policing and how that integrates into the force? Yes, uh, they've been a casualty of having to um, move resource to meet other threats, um, higher threats. Um, that's not to say that the threat on the road isn't significant, it is. But the arrival of county lines and organised crime has meant that, and, and that the, the sheer increase in firearms incidents has meant that we've had to put more effort uh, into those higher threats. That's left a gap. And we know that the highways, as well as being incredibly useful to us all in society, can facilitate um, um, a network of routes for criminality. Um, and we want to deny criminals the use of the road. We want it to be a safe place for people to travel, unhindered by the threat and the fear of criminals using it as well. Uh, that's a big task. It requires presence. It requires highly skilled drivers um, with the right equipment to be present and um, engage with the motorists, where appropriate, take the right action to address the criminality. Um, just being present, uh, present, uh, present might deter uh, the likelihood of people coming through our county. I, you know, I don't want them anywhere, but if they're gonna make a choice of coming through our county or someone else's, if we're present and we're proactive, uh, then go somewhere else. I don't want people traveling through our county with guns in the boot. I want them stopped, I want the, the gun recovered, and I want them prosecuted. The same if they're trafficking people in the back of a lorry. It's, it, you know, it's completely unacceptable behaviour. And uh, by being present with additional investment, I want us to, to get back involved to the right degree in that activity. Okay. I, I can feel uh, it coming already. Some people will say to me, bringing back traffic police, you're just going to pick on the motorists, they're a cash cow, you know, get, go and catch the real people. What would you say to that? I don't subscribe to that at all. That, that, that might be a byproduct occasionally. It's not the, the primary purpose at all. The primary purpose is to be present to reassure the public who deserve to see the police and be reassured so that we can assist them if they do end up uh, getting involved in a collision uh, or they need uh, our urgent assistance. We're there to save life, first and foremost. We're there then to prevent crime, secondly. And thirdly, if we need to, we'll enforce the law. So that's the order within okay. which I want the, um, the presence to be felt. Good. And another myth, I know that the fines that are issued do not come back to the police here in Gloucestershire or anywhere else at the moment. They are all to Treasury. Indeed. Yeah, good. So will the public actually see a difference on those policing? Yes, they will. Uh, the, the plan is um, with the money, we would uh, recruit uh, and train and place on our highways additional roads policing officers. Um, they're specialists in their own right. Okay. They do a very difficult job um, and they're very welcomed in the organisation. Uh, and I want to see them back doing what they were 
designed and trained to do. They're passionate about their role, mm -hmm. like all of our staff. Uh, there's just not enough of them. It's certainly a gap in policing that I've identified, and I don't like seeing big gaps like that. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful for you giving it that attention. I think it's important because gaps are always filled by somebody, and that can be some pretty appalling behaviour on our roads. And as you say, we have major roads, and we know that people traffic guns and people through those, and they should not feel comfy on those roads. And, and again, thank you to the special constabulary. You've invested in a new vehicle for them. The 417 seems to be getting policed now. So, it, you know, it's not just money, money, money. That's really effective what they're doing up there. And uh, Thank you. It's a good point, Mark. It's not just the motorways either. Yeah. Um, the motorways are important. They're very hostile places to police and to uh, to be a member of the public stood on the side of the of the motorway is it, it's not a, uh, a good place to be left for too long without support so but um, policing beyond the motorway and onto our main arterial uh, networks yeah. is also important extending into the county where we can absolutely because i know some of our rural communities feel not abandoned but they're on the periphery of the county and i know you've been doing work with our bordering forces to make sure those gaps are filled and so what's the end of our county and the end of their county is kind of immaterial. We all support each other, is, is that right? Yes, I mean, the public shouldn't need to worry about boundaries. They no. are members of the public who need service from the police. Uh, and we have very good cross-border relationships with the forces that border us. Uh, the criminals certainly don't respect boundaries. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we operate in an effective way with our neighbours and we have as I say, good relationships with them, good understanding on how we would support each other to send the nearest resource, even if it's from another force, um, rather than waiting for one that's within the county but too far away. That's, that's not how we operate. For, for some time, I've been working very closely with the elderly community, those the most vulnerable people, and I've been quite horrified by some of the offences that are committed against the elderly and the more vulnerable, you know, the, the frauds that they're, that they're they're facing, which are just soul destroying, life life destroying, and I know that's part of the the neighbourhood work as well. So I'm very pleased that there's investment for adults at risk, which is an area which we've concentrated on, but it's been tough to actually get there. Why did you ask for additional money for that particular area, and what would the public see? differently for their elderly, more vulnerable relatives or themselves when they become elderly and more vulnerable? Well, quite rightly, there are um, obligations on um, many of us, uh, particularly the police in relation to the Adult Care Act, and we want to make sure that our obligations to protect um, vulnerable elderly members of our, of our community are in place. Uh, we know that there's a, an underreported amount of individuals who are being, as you quite rightly say, Martin, um, seduced out of their money, defrauded out of their money, threatened out of their life savings, um, their soft targets on, on occasion, and the impact of that can be devastating for uh, a, an older person. And it can lead to depression, mental health, mm. and in, in an extreme case, even potential um, premature death because of the shock uh, that, that is caused. So, you know, getting underneath that to understand the full extent and making sure that we're doing absolutely everything we can to equip people as they get older to look after themselves and know where to go for support is the thrust of what we're trying to, to, to build in the county. But again, there's some tremendous work going on, multi-agency work um, and great work from charities to support the work that we're doing, which I know is supported through the Commissioner's Fund, but I think there's more to do. We've been here before asking for increases. They, they've not been quite so uh, significant as this one. But I can recall going back several years now, I think it might have been 13, 14, I'm not quite sure, where the council tax preset was raised by, I think, 2% at that particular time, maybe slightly more, I think it was 2%, on the back that you would improve the forces' response to cyber-related crime. We were the first force in the country, I think, to say cyber-related crime would be a priority for the force. At that time, it was my assessment, I, you may share this view, that we were pretty, um, or the force was not well prepared to deal with the offences taking place online, the grooming that's taking place on, on the iPhones, the iPads. Um, so he, he, here we are again. You're asking for a very small increase in, in cyber-related uh, investigations. Is that because, well, 
let's let's do that. Was that investment worthwhile? Are you, are, are we still good at it? We are good, uh, I, I believe. And have I, we I, delivered uh, on that one? Yes, we have, and I say that I hope with some humility and no complacency. But we are a forward-thinking force when it comes to our approach to uh, digital investigations and right. intelligence (DII). It's referred yeah. to uh, in policing. Uh, we know that cybercrime, cyber fraud, uh, sextortion, uh, cyber-enabled crime is on the increase, and it's complex, and it can occur and originate from outside not only of the county, but outside of the UK. So there's a complexity on how you get to the offender to either prevent it or bring someone to justice, and that requires specialism. But the request in relation to the proposal here, Martin, is more about a resource to help us sift through the enormity of digital data. So I, I was speaking to some of our colleagues from the Rape and Serious Sexual Offences team not long ago. They carry cases, about 18 cases each detective, relating to rape and serious sexual offence. Some of them take a year to, to get to a charge, if they ever end in charge or result in a charge. Some of them uh, are two years old and we get up to two or three uh, incidents coming in each night. Mm -hmm. So the, the pressure is building. Those detectives have to analyse um, the data held on the offender, uh, the alleged offender's phones, smartphones, um, digital devices. They're mini computers, supercomputers that hold vast quantity of gigabytes of data. Now, to be fair to those individuals and to do a thorough job for the victims and witnesses, that data has to be scarified and understood. It can take days to do that. A detective um, spending days doing it is not an efficient use of their time when they've got other cases coming in every day. And what I'm asking for here is some support for a specialist resource to be able to do that for them so that they can take the device, particularly challenging if it's in a different language. And one of our detectives was telling me not long ago, they, they uh, were looking to interview a suspect, two individuals actually for an allegation of rape, um, who weren't um, British nationals, and their phones, uh, three each, were all in a different language. So there's the added complication of um, the ability to interpret um, data that's held <coughs> in another language. So it's complex, it's something that we have to do, it's right to do it, it's very time consuming and highly specialist. And I want the right resource focusing on that to free up the detectives to do what they should be doing. I hope the public would appreciate we're not going with the headlines. This is already a strong organisation which is vulnerable without future investment. Would you agree with that assessment? I think we are a stable, um, effective organisation. Uh, with room for improvement, as I suspect all organisations are. Uh, we have some challenges. The situation has changed in terms of the demands on us, the complexity of those demands, uh, and our ambition to deliver an effective service remains um, unchanged. I wouldn't ask for money lightly because I'm fully aware of the impact uh, on people's you know, private incomes. Uh, they're, you know, financially, it's tough to ask for more tax. But I do believe that I have a responsibility to keep people safe from harm and to do that to the best of our ability. We're doing well. With more money, uh, we can do better. And I think that's what the public deserve. When I was given that additional flexibility, my initial thought was there's no way I can really go and ask for that amount of money, knowing that people, even within their own organisation, struggle to meet their mortgage payments and they're all on above the sort of on a living wage and above so based against that which is a real hard test to hit you, you still think we it's, it's right to go for this amount of money i do i um not long ago visited a food bank um and it was very plain to see um the impact on many people in the county uh, on how tough things are financially but I do also believe that um, a moderate amount of investment um, can save money in the long term because if these areas remain as thin as they are uh, and we don't do what I set out in my letter to you Martin, I do believe there will be a greater cost to the county. So although it's hard to, to see this in terms of it being an investor save, I don't want to use that language necessarily for this, but I do think it's a wise use of money 
where there will be a tangible difference to the people who came most. From my point of view, it's been a really interesting and hopefully helpful and informative chat. Can you just take my thanks back to the officers who I know pretty much overwhelmingly are desperate to see more officers on the front line, more officers helping them with their files, more people to actually get help and, and support the public. So thank I you will. very much. Thank you very much. Okay.